everyone, and thanks for joining us for this panel discussion. It's titled Understanding Diversity in Autism Research. I'm Connie Smith Hicks. I'm a child neurologist and neurogeneticist. I direct the Center for Synaptic Disorders at the Kennedy Krieger Institute, and I was the former medical director for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm an associate professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins, and my research efforts are directed at expanding the clinical phenotype of neurodevelopmental disorders with known genetic etiologies. And I'm also focused on developing outcome measures and quantitative metrics to support not only the care of individuals, but uh, to help facilitate uh, clinical trials. Joining me today, we have Dr. Bradley Schrager, uh, Dr. Ebony Holliday, and Omar Shanta. Dr. Schlager is a pediatric neurologist and developmental cognitive neuroscientist. He's the president and chief executive officer of Kennedy Krieger Institute, in Baltimore, Maryland. And he holds the Zanville Krieger Faculty Endowed Chair. He's also a professor of neurology and pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And he directs the NICHD funded intellectual and developmental disabilities Research Center at the Kennedy Krieger Institute, as well as the NINDS funded Child Neurologist Career Developmental Program, supporting the early career development of aspiring child neurologist physician scientists. Dr. Schlager's research efforts are directed at understanding the development of the brain's functional network architecture in typical and atypical developing children. Ebony Holliday is a research scientist at the Kennedy Krieger Institute's Center for Autism and Related Disorder. She is a school psychologist by profession, and Dr. Holliday's research and clinical interests include early identification and assessment of social communication differences and autism spectrum disorder in young children. In addition, she is interested in family-centered in interventions that are inclusive and culturally responsive. Her work also centers around the training and professional development of early care and education providers who serve young children with developmental disabilities and delay. And our final panelist, Omar Shanta, is a PhD candidate at UCSD. He studies bioinformatics and systems biology. He's a member of the Copy Number Variant Working Group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. He conducts his research in Dr. Jonathan Sabat's lab, and he focuses on copy number variation in people with psychiatric disorders. Congratulations, Omar. I heard that you'll be defending your thesis in the spring. It's awesome. Thank you. So today we'll be talking about diversity in autism. And as you know, diversity is a hallmark of autism. Yet research in autism does not capture the full heterogeneity of individuals on the spectrum. Some uh, misconceptions about autism and this may be that um, all autistic individuals have the same skills or difficulties, that they are all nonverbal and unable to communicate, or that they all have savant abilities and are either violent or aggressive. The statement when you meet one person with autism, you've only met one person with autism, speaks to the heterogeneity of this condition. And today we'll spend some time divining uh, both the, the, the diversity in autism, but in addition, the current state of diversity research in autism. And in addition, we'll end with a discussion of the roadblocks um, uh, to include uh, individuals of diverse backgrounds and abilities as participants in autism research. And we'll also try to touch on some of the strategies um, that one could use to address some of these challenges. So Ebony, we'll start with you. You know, I like to say that autism is an equal opportunity heterogeneous condition. It affects all races and ethnicities equally, yet differences in prevalence rate exist. So what are some of the factors uh, contributing to the difference in prevalence rates, both at the global, national, and regional level? 
And to what would you contribute the delay in the diagnosis of people of color? Thank you. Um, just wanted to say I'm happy to be uh, here today and kind of joining in this conversation uh, with everyone as well as my uh, fellow panel members. So thank you for that. So as we know, there have been some longstanding uh, differences in the prevalence rates of, of autism, especially among um, individuals of different races and, and ethnicities. Um, and when we think about that, also knowing that those prevalence rates for people of color are often lagging behind other individuals, particularly individuals um, of, of white backgrounds. And so when we think about that, I think some of the good news is that we've made progress um, in recent years. If we think of um, some of the recent um, data from CDC that was released um, last fall, we know that we've made some efforts in closing some of those gaps, um, those uh, race and ethnicity gaps that were there. Um, however, it is still something that we need to focus on. Um, so while overall we see the prevalence rates as one in 44, so we're familiar with that statistic, um, that definitely varies um, and in some areas varies widely depending on the site or the state within um, the United States. So I think globally, um, or when we look at that big picture, I think we have made some progress and, and that can be due to some of the outreach efforts I think that have been made over the years in, in certain um, communities of color. Um, different training efforts, I think, among clinicians um, that have uh, been going on different initiatives. So I think those areas are different, uh, definitely um, benefits and pluses that are there. Um, but again, you know, I think we still need to do some, um, some work in that area with making sure that gap is closed even more, um, and particularly looking at different states. So while, as an example, as we know, you know, the rate may be one in 44 in the United States, if we look at a state like California, that prevalence rate is one in 26. So if we're seeing that type of um, wide variability, that's also gonna have some implications um, within race and within ethnicity in those areas. Um, so again, I think we do need to kind of, um, focus on that area, look at what else we can do to make sure that um, if there are specific areas, specific states, looking at regions, um, to make sure that we are identifying um, individuals and, and children that should have diagnoses and making sure that they are able to access the services and the supports um, that they need for that. When we think about um, the reasons that these differences might exist um, with, with race and ethnicity, um, I think it could be a, a variety of areas, um, a variety of factors. Um, one is looking at access to services. So access to um, quality screening, quality surveillance, referrals that are there. We know that there are differences in referral rates. Uh, we know there are differences in referrals to early intervention programs. Um, and those are impacted by, by race and ethnicity. So that's one factor that, um, that could be present. Um, but also looking at, perhaps looking at under recognition of symptoms of, of autism, attributed, to, attributed it to something else, to other um, conditions, to other types of um, developmental um, areas or co-occurring conditions that, that might be present. Um, so that's another factor that, that could be there. When we think about um, other, areas and other factors, it could be biases. And so not necessarily things that are direct, but like implicit bias um, could be impacting clinicians, could be impacting uh, the way in which we refer, the way in which we screen. Um, so those are some issues that might come to play. Um, and then also when I'm thinking about um, our communities, when I'm thinking about um, communities of color, there may be um, within group differences, there may be cultural differences that are, that are there to play. There may be more of a wait and see approach in some cultures. Um, there might be uh, some distrust of the healthcare system in some ways. And so I think there is an interplay of various factors um, and it impacting uh, clinicians as well as families, as well as um, individuals to either seek services or to also access those services. Um, so those are kind of a few of my uh, my initial thoughts, but I definitely, you know, are, I'm seeing this, this difference and I think it is something that we um, definitely do need to um, focus on and we do need to target as we're kind of moving along in this area. Wonderful, thank you for that. You sort of touched on the idea of co-occurring uh, conditions. And so, Brad, I, I'd like to direct this one uh, to you. Um, 
know, psychiatric diagnoses occur uh, perhaps 10 to 41% uh, of uh, autistic individuals and uh, many of whom are reported to have at least one uh, mental health diagnosis. So can co-occurring mental health diagnoses be separated from the autism? Or do you think it influences the manifestation of the autistic features? Well, at, at the surface, it, it does seem that you know, diagnostically, one should be able to pull apart autism from, say, ADHD or generalized anxiety and, and so forth. And I say that because the diagnoses are based on, on clinical criteria that are intended to, you know, as, as much as possible, draw clean delineations between these diagnostic constructs. But the reality, you know, underscored by the frequent co-occurrence that you just mentioned, Connie, is that it, it's, it's really, it's not likely to be easy to do that. And there, I think there's an interesting history here. Uh, I like to point out that not too long ago, you know, one was not really allowed to diagnose ADHD and autism in the same, uh, in the same individual. Um, and if you, I remember there were a, a number of fascinating studies from some years ago that showed that if you do a, a data-driven latent class analysis of the phenotypes of patients who using DSM criteria were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and uh, ADHD, you could pull out subtypes of those, of those patients who could be um, indistinguishable from each other. So that severe combined ADHD looked a lot like essentially indistinguishable from autism spectrum disorder. Now, more recently, we are now allowed to make both diagnoses in the same individual, in the same patient. So that's an example of the pretty significant overlap in the diagnoses despite the, the criteria. But, you know, at a, at a deeper level, um, the issue becomes, I think, does say generalized anxiety disorder, does it look different in the, in the setting of autism? And on clinical grounds, I, I think it does. And I think in general, neuropsychiatric disorders don't simply you know, overlay on top of autism in the background. Instead, I, I think they, these conditions interact in complex ways. And, and that makes sense to me on first principles because we're, we're talking about you know, brain function as the basis for those diagnoses. And it's not really an academic argument, it's, it's, it has real implications. So if, if clinical trials, for example, um, let's say pharmacotherapy or, or cognitive behavioral therapy for generalized anxiety, if those exclude people with autism, with an autism diagnosis from participating in the study, we can't know whether the evidence basis for treating anxiety coming from that study will or will not apply to people who also have an autism diagnosis. And intellectual disability is another good example here. You know, intellectual disability is more common in people with autism than in the general population, and the converse is true. Autism is more common in individuals with intellectual disability, and that's the case for a number of, of reasons. But the, the same issues in play here. If, if people with intellectual disability are excluded from autism studies or, or vice versa, and they, they frequently are excluded, we, we can't learn how the co-occurrence of those interacting conditions you know, influence outcomes or, or response to intervention. Valid point. Now, Ebony, I'm gonna direct this one back to you. Um, autism and co-occurring diagnosis of ID, um, there is, some reports that uh, the greater incidence of intellectual disabilities in uh, Blacks with uh, autism diagnosis. We discussed earlier a little bit about the delay in uh, diagnosis. Do you think that this is, um, that this delay in diagnosis, is it cause or coincidence? Is there, any reason to think that the delay impacted the development? Thank you, Connie. I think it's a really important um, and interesting question, um, and I think topic to, to kind of talk about for, uh, for a bit. Um, as you said, we do know that um, there is a kind of an increasing um, rate of ID, um, especially among 
um, Black, African American population and, and in children um, as well. And I, I don't know that the specific reasons are completely understood, but there is definitely um, some suggested conceptual thoughts and, and models of that. Um, one of the things I, I wonder about is, you know, kind of this cumulative risk um, that is there in, in some populations. And so when we think about access, so if that is an issue, access to services, if we're getting later diagnoses, later referrals, then that is going to imply um, perhaps later intervention, later treatment um, of, of symptoms. And when we think about that whole cascade, we know the important, we know about neuroplasticity and how important um, early intervention is. And so when we think about all of that being delayed, what that cascade you know, could, could implicate, what those implications could be. Um, and then we also know that there are just other risk factors that I think differential, um, differentially and disproportionately impact um, Black and African-American individuals. Um, so if we think of things like even just poverty, right? And we know the impact that poverty has on development, on language, on um, all of these other factors um, that are especially important in child development. And then we know that poverty rates are also disproportionate among Black and African American um, populations. Uh, we know that that also impacts um, at times um, uh, preterm birth and low birth weight. And we know that that is more um, prevalent among Black and African American populations. So again, we're just seeing some of these perinatal risk factors. We are seeing perhaps poverty in some populations. We are seeing less access. And then when we put all that together, that cumulative risk may um, be something that impacts these rates that we're seeing, these increasing rates or these differences in prevalence among, I think, African American and, and um, Black population when we're looking at autism. So I think those are some factors that we can think about. Um, is it this you know, cumulative risk? Is it one or more of these factors? I think there are definitely things that we can look at and we can consider as we're thinking about why these differences um, are persistent, why are they are increasing um, in, in certain race and ethnicity, uh, ethnicity uh, populations. That's rather intriguing. So you know what it, it suggests is that there are multiple factors occurring in any individual that not only contributes to their clinical features of autism, but the existence of uh, these co-occurring uh, diagnoses. Um, so Omar, the, the idea here is this high uh, prevalence of co-occurring diagnoses, uh, primarily psychiatric uh, diagnoses or neurodevelopmental uh, diagnoses with autism suggests that there is likely a shared etiology. So can you comment on the genetics of autism and the interplay between perhaps gene and environment, uh, Ebony shared uh, the impact of poverty and uh, among other things. Can you tell us a little bit about that? There's definitely a lot of evidence right now in the genetic studies of, uh, of a shared genetic ideology between different psychiatric disorders. Like I see it in my own results in my own research and also read it all the time um, in different papers from other studies. Uh, for example, like in uh, one of the known risk loci in neurodevelopment disorders on uh, chromosome 16, uh, 6P11.2, you can see that um, if you duplicate a sequence um, at a specific place, then you see an increase of risk in both autism and schizophrenia. Um, but then on the other side, there's, along with the shared ideology, there's a lot of loci like that, but there's also um, disorder-specific loci that are only present in autism or only present in schizophrenia. And um, so on the flip side, if you, instead of duplicating the sequence, if you delete the sequence at the same location, then it's only a risk for autism and not schizophrenia. So you can kind of see like these, um, there, there, it, it's, it's differs by location, um, and, uh, what the genetic effects on, uh, are on the specific disorders. So that's, um, that's, that's actually been really interesting to, to see. And on, on the comment of, uh, uh like are people, um, looking at, uh, genetics, um, along with environmental factors there, there actually was a data set that was released, um, not too long ago called the UK Biobank. And they actually have a lot of genetic data um, for different disorders. 
and they also included for the same people, um, they included a questionnaire so that they can actually um, uh, provide different environmental factors for these different people. So geneticists are using that, that data set to answer a lot of these questions. So, um, and that data set has like about uh, 400,000 um, individuals already. Um, so it's a pretty good resource for, for uh, research uh, advances. Very interesting. So in, in, in addition to uh, your comments, there are uh, these common variants that are identified out of uh, GWAS studies and rare variants that are identified generally from um, you know, whole exome sequencing done clinically. And it's, it's been rather interesting uh, to read the literature and think about the interplay between these two kind of variants, the more common ones that could perhaps explain um, some of the broader autism phenotype and the, the rare powerful ones that have been attributed to uh, single gene disorders. And I often wonder, you know, since we're not able to uh, screen for common variants clinically, um, it would be nice to design uh, a study that allows us to look at the interplay between the two uh, in populations in general. And that leads us to our, our next part where we're going to talk a little bit about um, the current state of diversity in autism research. Um, you know, we know that research takes many different forms. We have epidemiological studies, studies that are directed at understanding the neurobiological basis or the psychobehavioral uh, features of autism. And the, the goals are generally to inform uh, not just intervention, but policy. We've already discussed and acknowledged the diversity of individuals who participate in autism uh, research. Um, and we acknowledge that it, it doesn't really reflect the heterogeneity of the condition. At least in the United States, we have fewer people of color uh, who are, they're generally diagnosed earlier, uh, older rather, and um, are often uh, less frequently identified. Um, so, you know, I've been giving some thought to what might be some of the factors that contribute to the disparity of the individuals who participate in autism research. And so, uh, Brad, I'm going to have you take this one. And my, my um, primary question to you is based on your experience in, as a developmental cognitive neuroscientist. Um, how would you describe the demographics of the individuals who participate in autism research and how does the heterogeneity of these individuals impact your approach to research or the approach to research in the field in general? Yeah, that's a, it's a substantial question, Connie. I, and as you've highlighted uh, importantly several times, uh, autism is highly heterogeneous. And so I'd like to take a step back and, and just say that the situation with inclusion and exclusion in autism research is really a microcosm of the general issue, I think, of inclusion and exclusion in clinical investigation per se. I don't mean just I don't mean clinical trials, but clinical investigation, patient-oriented or human-oriented uh, research. And of course, domains of diversity include race and ethnicity, uh, socioeconomics, Sex and gender, and you know those are those are separable constructs. Sex and gender are often used interchangeably, but inaccurately. So, um, and of of course, often not mentioned is disability and and neurodiversity, and the exclusion of people with disabilities and other chronic conditions, especially cognitive, affective, uh, uh, mobility. These are long-standing and pervasive. It's it's a it's a huge problem that ripples through clinical investigation per se. And I think multiple factors are involved here, including say kind of in a euphemistic way, the tendency for uh, investigators to collect population samples of convenience. You know, that's particularly true with smaller sample size studies. And by, by convenience, I really mean individuals who are easier to recruit, easier to consent, easier to retain, 
and just thinking uh, about that idea of uh, samples of convenience, underneath all of that, I think all of those uh, factors that Ebony just so clearly delineated uh, earlier in, the, in this discussion, those are all underneath, uh, underneath this euphemistic uh, samples of convenience. Mm -hmm. But exclusion is also uh, driven by the way we think about clinical investigation, where the idea of too much heterogeneity is thought of as, as noise or confounding factors rather than a, an accurate reflection of the true clinical landscape, the true biology, if you will. So the, these ideas of noise and confounding variables, um, they are thought to interfere with you know, traditional study design, power analyses, interpretation of data. So there are, there are active overt steps taken uh, in study design to, to try to narrow the variability and accentuate homogeneity of sample. That's, that's on purpose. So we end up in autism related research having study participates who in their daily lives tend to require less services and supports or perhaps not at all, and who are therefore easier to recruit, easier to consent, easier to retain in the study. And so a consequence of that practice of exclusion, in addition to the ongoing marginalization of people through such practice, including in that the concept of inclusion in, in investigation, is to have research that ultimately doesn't really generalize broadly to the population as a whole. Like it's, a, it's problematic to say, for example, that, um, that a study that provides evidence basis for say heart disease applies to me if I have a disability or a condition that would have excluded me from participating in that study. You know, a fundamental uh, question about what evidence-based really means. You know, one of the starkest examples, um, just to digress a little bit, is the longstanding exclusion of people with Down syndrome from Alzheimer's disease clinical investigation over Half of people with Down syndrome will develop Alzheimer's as they age. And people with Down, are, they're, they're living longer because of improved overall pediatric care. And finally, just, just relatively recently, the NIH has shifted to uh, support not only the inclusion of people with Down syndrome, but to also recognize that their inclusion bolsters significantly our understanding of Alzheimer's disease for people without Down syndrome, which, which is an ex excellent example of how, you know, all of us can benefit from, from greater inclusion and investigation. I'll leave it there. Yeah. You know, as I was listening to you, it, it uh, reminded me that uh, another challenge in uh, autism research is that there is a tendency uh, to focus on younger individuals. Um, and individuals with autism are living longer. Uh, granted, it's also a challenge to provide uh, care for them, but lifespan approach to care and research is critical. Um, so thank you for that. That was, that was insightful. Uh, Omar, we have, we have talked often about, you know, the, the idea that, um, or knowledge of autism has come largely from individuals of European uh, descent. And I assume it's reasonable to expect that the same is true for uh, autism genetics and the genetics of other um, psychiatric or neurodevelopmental disorders. So um, has that changed over time? And uh, how does a lack of genomic diversity impact um, you know, the results of studies done with these large data sets. Yeah, there's definitely um, a bias towards European samples in a lot of the genetic studies, and not just in autism, but like across the board of major psychiatric disorders. And um, it's it has changed recently, actually, like within the past few years. Um, there's, uh, there is, there is, people have recognized that there's a huge disparity between the sample sizes of like um, 500,000 Europeans versus like 30 or 40,000 Africans um, within a study. And then usually what happens in, when you publish a paper and you see this kind of huge disparity is that 
um, the paper say, okay, these results are representative of Europeans because most of our samples are European. And the, um, it, it doesn't necessarily um, uh, generalize towards other populations. And the reason that it doesn't generalize is because of the heterogeneity, actually, and because uh, people are different. So their genes, um, because their genes are different, they're, um, they have different characteristics, right? So according to those lines, like if, if, uh, if you have a mutation um, within one population, um, but the, that locus is a heterogeneous locus and it's different in different population, then it can have different effects on someone from a different population. And we won't necessarily see that if we only have Europeans inside of a study. So that's, that's why it's, it's very important. And um, actually in right now, the um, disorder that's um, added uh, African samples most recently is major depressive disorder. And they've been able to show um, some similarities, but also some differences between the risk loci inside of major depression disorder. So that's, that's where it is right now. Brad, how does uh, knowing the genetics of autism, how, how, does that, uh, how does that factor in to research questions and research design? For example, you know, you do a, a study is done with, I don't know, hundreds of individuals uh, with autism, but the genetic etiology is variable. Uh, some may have known genetic risks, uh, others may have it, but it's not yet been identified. So how do we factor that in uh, to research question and design? Well, it's, um, it's a, a complicated space right now because for the reasons that you stated, that Omar just stated, we're, we're sort of in a nascent uh, phase for understanding background really um, beyond European uh, ancestry data. You know, autism describes a set of identifiable, observable traits. These are traits that are you know, manifestations of brain function, and they're likely to be the result of a wide variety of factors, including neurogenetic. But, but just because those phenotypic traits converge, it, it doesn't mean that the mechanisms by which those traits in a, in a given person, that, that they're shared. It, it doesn't, you can't conclude that. There, there can be dissociation between overt phenotype and the underlying um, multitude of mechanisms, complex interactions of multitude of mechanisms. And just to underscore what Omar just laid out so nicely, you know, a variant that produces an autistic set of traits in someone with European genetic ancestry may not necessarily produce the same phenotype in people whose genetic ancestry is African or, or non-European. Different neurogenetic factors are likely to drive different developmental processes, and they may emerge as comparable overt phenotypes, but the neurobiology can be different. So th those differences really could be influential on in how certain interventions are or not uh, effective in a given patient. So understanding those neurogenetic drivers and how they interact with genetic background, as well as environmental exposures, this is not a nature-nurture kind of argument. This is a nature by nurture, like interacting, cascading interactions across development, across the lifespan, understanding that complex biological landscape, that will very likely inform us of how to more appropriately design studies and trials, you know, most effectively. Again, you know, we haven't really uh, touched on this, but the part and parcel of the focus on heterogeneity is the recognition that our clinical trial work should be focused on individual people. And ultimately we wanna to get to individualized, precise treatments. So understanding all those factors, I think, I would assert, will make it possible for us to have wiser uh, study designs that are more likely to yield uh, better better information for uh, individualized uh, decision-making for patients. Thank you for that setup. Uh, it takes me to Ebony where I'm curious to know what's the current focus and direction of implementation science in, in autism research. Thank you for that, that question as well. So 
in, in our work um, that we're doing uh, specifically in the Center for Autism as well, we are looking in, in early childhood. And, and some of that we are finding, taking the principles of implementation science has really been essential um, for making sure we're translating this work um, from research, from the research lab to the community. And implementation science is really just that study of the procedures um, and the strategies that we look to um, and that we can use um, to make sure that we're translating and that we're scaling research and putting it in the hands of the community. And the community might be, um, it might be an organization, it might be a community agency, it may be schools, it may be directly into homes um, with families. Um, but it's really looking at how do we decrease and how do we shorten that um, that research to practice gap that we know can be like about 17 years, right? When we're getting, what, so the research that we know when it actually gets into practice and gets used, um, there is a, unfortunately that 17 year that's there or that um, no do gap um, that we, we typically use. So implementation um, science is a strategy and a principle and it's really a field um, to better target that and to decrease that gap from research to practice. So it's really, and it can be used with any, um, any population, any intervention, but it's really that study of what do we need to do and how do we effectively and efficiently translate this research, our basic research or research that we're doing in the lab that works well under certain conditions with certain resources, with certain funding, and how do we translate that to the real world? And so when we think about autism, there definitely has been a push in the field with autism interventions and treatment. And my area and focus in my population is typically children and early childhood. So that's kind of where I talk from. Um, but when we think about what can we do um, to really make sure these interventions that we're finding are effective and that are working, how can we make sure that these are then translated, for example, in a preschool setting? Or how can we make sure in early childhood that um, parents and that caregivers and caretakers are able to implement these strategies that we um, know can be effective? Um, and part of implementation science um, theories and conceptual models, a lot of times there are phases and there are stages in that. And some of the first few are really what we call exploration and planning. Um, and so part of that really takes into consideration who is the population, what really are the issues? Because at times at researchers, sometimes you know, we, we may feel like we know best, this is what you need, this is what a community is gonna, this is what will work best for a community. And implementation science is really about getting buy into our research and so, or getting buy into treatment and getting buy into to interventions and really partnering with the people who are our population and not it just and not us kind of coming in with a package and saying here you need to implement this but really partnering and saying this is something we designed what do you think about it you know what changes might need to be made from this um, controlled trial that we've done until maybe until it goes into the classroom or until it goes into schools. What changes, what considerations do we need to, to take into consideration? Is this feasible to do? Because something that might be feasible in an RCT might not be feasible for a general you know, teacher to do, for a parent to do, or for a community agency to do. Um, and so those are things that we take into consideration in that planning stage and in that exploration stage of, of taking this nice research package or intervention that we have, and again, saying, what do we need to do to make sure that it can live in the community, that it can really do what we want it to do so it's not just housed in academic institutions and not just housed in, in research journals, um, but that it's actually um, making a difference in that day to day. Um, and so that is part of what we're doing. Um, you know, in autism and, and individuals that are using implementation science to really inform interventions that maybe we've proven and that we've shown are evidence-based, how then can we take that and translate it? Um, and th the last point I'll, I'll make is, you know, I think it's really important then to make sure that the, the research that we are doing is generalizable, is representative, um, because again, it's gonna be hard to take it to scale for a larger um, population if it isn't inclusive in what we're doing. So that is always the first step is to make sure that our research is inclusive in many of the ways that I think we've all talked about, especially at, um, Brad uh, talked about many um, good points with that. And I absolutely agree with all those points that were made. We really need to make sure that um, our research is inclusive, that it's representative, and then we can think about taking it to scale, translating it for different um, populations in different communities. Great. Now, is it is it reasonable to think that um, 
challenges with the generalizability of the research plays into the disparity in the distribution of services within the school system? Or are, are those two separate um, issues? I, um, I definitely think it bears, I think there's an interplay of, of those that are, that are there. Um, I think unfortunately we do find that um, the research that we have is often on, for example, middle-class populations, may not include many um, children, individuals um, of color as well in the autistic community. So I think then we have that research and while it may work and it may be, it may be a fact that it is effective and it is evidence-based for everyone. But if we don't have an inclusive population, we don't necessarily know that for sure. So we need to make sure that um, again, that that research is generalizable, um, because then what happens is often when we have um, research and we're showing and we're saying that it's evidence-based, often then that may get changed into policy. So policymakers are going to make note of that. Um, often schools will do a global uptake of an intervention, and it's going to be in place for 10 years, you know, in a school. And so if that research is not generalizable, if it actually was not um, inclusive of um, disability level, of cognition, of race, ethnicity, of all of those factors we've talked about um, today, I think it may be a fact that it's, it may not be effective for everyone. And then we see those gaps, um, whether they are in race and ethnicity or, or gender or sex, we see those gaps perhaps widen. Um, so again, I, I do think it's an interplay. I think we need to um, make sure our samples are inclusive in, in multiple ways. Um, and then we need to really be mindful about how we are translating those or making sure we are translating those in partnership with the individuals who will be implementing it and or who, the, the, who our target population is. For the, the remainder of our time together, I want to touch a little bit. I, I know we've sort of discussed this a bit, but I want to give us an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, roadblocks and strategies for inclusion of uh, autistic people uh, from diverse ethnic backgrounds and abilities, um, socioeconomic status, you name it, uh, in research. Um, Brad, you commented on the inclusion or rather the exclusion of people with intellectual disabilities and psychiatric diagnosis from autism research. And uh, you, you spoke to uh, some of the uh, challenges um, that uh, results in, in this uh, process. Is there, are, are there additional roadblocks um, that you would want to mention at this time? And what are some of the strategies that you think uh, we can use to be become more inclusive? So just take, taking a step back to what is the goal of clinical investigation, broadly speaking? And um, I think, because I think that has a lot to do with the exclusion uh, approach in autism research of people with uh, co-occurring psychiatric dis disorders, of co-occurring intellectual disability, and so on. And you know, broadly speaking, the objective of clinical trials and, and the, 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 or clinical investigation and the coin of the realm in clinical trial investigation is the randomized clinical trial. It's really about studying not an individual, but the central tendency of, and in principle, you know, a, really, a well-defined group of people and how well that well-defined group of people responds to some intervention. And if that study can show a shift in the central tendency that's you know, statistically reliable with a clin clinically meaningful effect size, then it gets elevated to evidence basis, you know, evidence that intervention can be effective. So these trials tend to hone in on certain inclusion and exclusion criteria intentionally to assure that they have the cleanest sampling with the best likelihood of getting signal from that intervention. These studies are not designed to then you know, understand which individual will or will not respond to the treatment. It's really whether the treatment will affect the central tendency of the group. And so this, this push to precision or individualized medicine must go hand in hand with a push for broadening inclusion criteria and the development of methods that that we learn how to embrace and capitalize on heterogeneity of, of people. 
And that includes disability, chronic conditions, neurodiversity, in addition to race and ethnicity, sex and gender, socioeconomics, uh, genetic ancestry, and, and so forth. We have to learn how to incorporate all that information. And so this is, it's critical of, of, the, of the RCT, uh, admittedly so, but we, in order to get to the next level, we have to recognize that that approach is intentionally not working towards individuals. And so within autism research, these issues are very much in play. And I, I think that to, to get to the strategies um, and barriers, I mean, we need review panels for studies who, who focus on seeing that clean sample of autism without co-occurring conditions like ADHD and anxiety and mood and intellectual disability, epilepsy and, and so on. We need those panels to shift their thinkings because in the real world, autism co-occurs with all those conditions in the real world. And so if, if clinical investigation involving autistic individuals excludes those, well, the work doesn't reflect the real world situations we face. And we will continue to, to make um, incremental at best progress and not have generalizable information. So very commonly studies addressing autism you know, exclude specifically for intellectual disability or, or people who have the most significant forms of behavioral challenges that we, we heard about earlier in the conference or for uh, people who require significant support such as alternative and, and um, augmentative communication as just some of the examples of, of the arguments for exclusion. But, you know, clinical investigation must reflect all of us in order for the work to benefit all of us. So we need review panels that critique study designs, and, and that includes you know, IRBs, to support these notions of expanding inclusion criteria whenever possible. And then funding and regulatory agencies need to pay attention to these issues if, if again, if the intention is for the research work to ultimately benefit all of us, we have to shift into this, this next level of, of investigation. And we need to find ways to understand how to use the richness of data that, that comes from this diverse heterogeneous, heterogeneous large sample, like, like the kind that Omar just described a moment ago. Those really rich samples, we, we need to learn how to not shrink them down and squeeze out the variance, but capitalize on it again so we can get to large effects at the population level and then individual level uh, characterization so that the work can ultimately be applied to individual people and patients. As I listened to you, it made me think about uh, the need while being more inclusive to within the larger group have ways of stratifying. And that would hopefully help us, you know, we're going to have responders to some uh, intervention, non-responders, what are some of the common features? And that, that will hopefully help us as we move towards uh, precision medicine. Well, I think, I think stratifying is the bootstrap to get to individualized. So, I mean, I, I, I know what I'm saying sounds sort of grandiose, but, but we need to get there. And, um, and so I think the step, the next step is to have in earnest real stratification that, that takes into account this information and to not, and to not disparage um, allowing data to drive some of the, the, um, that stratification and not have a top down, we already know going in what the strata should look like, but to, to um, allow data to help us sort that out. We now have massive amounts of data and we have computational capacities to deal with it. We need, we need to em embrace that next, that next level of analysis and, and learn how to do it. Okay, so implementation scientist, any um, thoughts about way forward, uh, current challenges? What do you, what do you, what do you thought, Stephanie? I think it's both um, excitement for way forward. I think there are a lot of, um, I think there's a good outlook, but I think there are also barriers to kind of take, take into consideration, especially with um, implementation science and also pulling upon principles when we think about research, um, community engaged research. Um, and that is somewhat of a, a similar field, but looking at how we get the community, how we get our, our 
populations, our targeted populations to also participate um, with us in this. And so it's not just um, a top-down researcher, um, you know, this is what is prescribed, but it's really making sure that we're hearing from individuals, what do you need? Does this sound like it is something, you know, that is effective? And then being able to really create research together. Um, that's not always going to be possible for every field and for every area, of course, but for those um, intervention programs or treatment areas where that could work and be feasible, um, I think it's definitely something to take a, a step to. And I, I do think it is a, a mindset change, um, perhaps for researchers, and I think this um, plays a lot with what um, Brad was saying, which I, I absolutely agree with, um, looking at, I think, broadening um, uh, looking at broadening inclusion criteria for research, but also thinking about, I think the the multiple factors that are at play. So looking at reviewers and you know, and individuals being more open as you're reviewing journal articles, as you're reviewing um, things that have been submitted, taking into consideration what is this is this population diverse? Um, because I feel like there may be some barriers to researchers feeling like they can broaden those criteria. Because is this something that's going to be um, then accepted? Is this something that's going to be in line with what reviewers are looking for? Um, so I think there are those push-pull factors that, that may be in place. So I think having that um, mindset change among everyone, I think is going to be something, it's, it's a big plan, it's a big take, but I think that's something that we should really strive to do. Um, with implementation science and with uh, community-engaged research, um, again, it's really looking at that partnership. It's really looking at saying, um, what can we do together? So we are um, at our center, we are have established some um, community and academic partnerships. And so we meet regularly with them, whether it's bi-weekly, whether it's monthly. Um, we have community advisory um, boards where we sit down with um, individuals from the community um, at, who are invested in the work and the research that we're doing. And they give us really honest and genuine feedback about some of our ideas, things that we've done, um, things even looking to research flyers, you know, and sometimes we give that information out and we get information back that we haven't even thought about um, that really makes our research better or they're giving us ideas about um, recruitment strategies that we may not have thought about. Um, and so those partnerships with the community um, and those partnerships with other institutions in the area, we have found those to be invaluable in some of the research that we're doing. Um, and I think it only makes your research better when you include more individuals, we have more buy-in. Um, we are doing some uh, stakeholder analyses. So what, you know, what that means is we have our group, we started with maybe a group of about six people and then they referred us to other people who referred us to other people. And you know, we have this network now of about 40 individuals in our regional area who know about our research, who either met with us you know, once or twice, who have done some type of a participation. And so when we think about how we scale up research, how we are um, translating ideas um, into practice, into the hands of the community, I really think we have to do some outreach for that. And so those are some of the steps that we're trying to take um, as it relates to implementation science. How do we take these ideas and really make sure that they're in the hands of the community, really make sure that they are feasible, that they are acceptable um, to individuals, um, and that ultimately it's something that can be sustained over time. We want sustainability. We don't want it to just be, you know, an eight-week intervention that we do and then it's done. We want it to make sure, we want to make sure that it's something that can um, sustain over time. Um, so we are using those principles of just exploring, planning, and really working together in partnership um, with, with populations. Again, I, I definitely understand that's not possible with all types of research, um, but with the work that we are doing and, and that I'm doing with, you know, with schools, um, with providers, with early care and education providers, with families. Um, those are some things we definitely can take into, into um, consideration and they really help to make our, um, our intervention uh, and our research more meaningful.